Good morning again, and welcome to 2022, a year that many of us have been waiting for a long time, perhaps even since March 2020. My daughter keeps saying to me, it's sort of like a big, long year, and I agree. 2022 is the year of the water tiger in the Chinese New Year, starting February 1st, when we look at that interpretation, this year is predicted to be a year with no middle ground, with great success for some, much change for all, and others who are at risk of being burned. The Farmer's Almanac encourages us to prepare for a winter of shivers as the months ahead look extraordinarily cold. Predictions continue to be grim for climate change and beyond if we do not make major changes. Yet, with all of that, as a species, humans lean toward optimism. It is perhaps a built-in defense mechanism or an essential element of resiliency to keep us going when times are tough. I do have a sense of optimism for this year ahead that I didn't have at the start of 2021. I can't fully explain it to you. However, I'll take it. Even with this temporary going fully online again, as sad as it makes me feel, and it does, <laughs> And as much as it touches in me the sort of past traumas of the last almost two years, which reminds me that that's what trauma is and does, lives in our cells. That's what grief is and does, lives in our bodies. So any time we experience grief or loss or any kind of trauma, it isn't just the moment that's responding. It's all from our past that has yet to be fully integrated into ourselves. But even with that, I don't have the same sense of dread. I have a sense of knowing that this indeed will be temporary, hopefully only the six months or six weeks ahead. And as one parishioner said in an email to me, may this be the final sort of push of ever having to do it exactly this way. And yet with all of that, many good things did happen in 2021, even with all of its challenges. And they could be overlooked or forgotten or not appreciated if we don't take a moment to name just a few of them. Astrologist Rob Bresny compiled quite an inspiring list and because we as Unitarian Universalists do draw our inspiration from many sources, I'm going to share some of them with you now. He wrote, things that made the world a better place in 2021. The Oscars had their most diverse year ever. Over 9.7 million Americans are now following plant-based diets whereas in 2004, that was only 290,000 people. The United States rejoined the Paris Climate Accord and the World Health Organization. More than 8.47 billion COVID-19 vaccinations were administered globally. The airline United flew the first passenger aircraft with 100% sustainable fuel. Mexico elected the country's first transgender lawmakers. A Filipino was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in a first for her country. Sales of zero emission vehicles surpassed diesel sales in Europe. An African woman leads the World Trade Organization. Protections were restored for three national monuments in the United States, including the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts off the coast of New England. Derek Chauvin was found guilty on all three charges related to George Floyd's death and sentenced to 22 and a half years in prison. The fossil fuel divestment movement grew. 
monarch butterfly populations are actually beginning to bounce back. National Geographic cartographers recognize the world's fifth ocean. Kamala Harris became the first female and black vice president of the United States. Donald Trump was banned from Twitter. China eliminated malaria. Drones helped us get a handle on plastic pollution. Dutch bee hotels helped bee populations remain stable. The Met removed the Sackler name from its galleries. A thought-to-be-extinct orchid was found on a London roof. Uber drivers were granted workers' rights in the United Kingdom. And there were others. I am optimistic that people are taking things seriously including the need to be involved in making the changes they want to see in the world, in no small part by removing barriers to relationships across differences and caring for one another. In keeping with that theme, we recognized at FRS the need to be vigilant in protecting our and our community's health and the resources in the community, the hospital, and the uh, for frontline workers, and at the same time creating as many options as possible for people to more safely connect. The reopening team is indeed grateful for the support that they have received in response to our decision to move all of our worship services online through February 13th. And as I said, we hope we can resume both in person and online starting February 20th. We're also continuing a long-held commitment to making a difference in the lives of our members and others as we prepare to welcome the Mirazi family of 11 to our parish hall the second week in January. This Afghan refugee family, actually called evacuees, will be coming to us after waiting to live in a safe place. They have been living in dangerous conditions in their country, most recently in tents on a military base. This is an example of how we put our values into practice. This is that example, not words on a paper, not how eloquently something is spoken, but when we put our deeds our actions aligned with our values, and then doing it in partnerships with other churches and many community members who aren't members of any of the churches, all of whom are dedicated to making this world a better place. Thank you to everyone who is stepping up to help, and it is impressive with cleaning up and preparing parish hall, donating items and funds, offering to support the family once they arrive by doing laundry, driving them to medical appointments, teaching ESL classes. I have to thank Annie Maurer, Ann Hauser, and Lee McLaughlin for the incredible amount of work they are putting into this, organizing all of the volunteer efforts. We still encourage you to join the Afghan refugee resettlement e email listserv to stay up to date with all that is happening, and you'll hear more about this next Sunday. We'll also be having a congregational conversation um, the week after next in response to a webinar we're going to be playing about Afghan culture so that we all can go into this, regardless of our um, relationship with what's been happening, with more knowledge and sensitivity and cultural awareness. And last, I'll just say about that that, you know, this is projected to be a two or three month time that they're living with us temporarily. We don't actually know. We know this will change us. We know these relationships are apt to go on probably for years afterwards once they have found homes and jobs. There's a lot of energy and enthusiasm now and what I ask is that you stay with this. And if this isn't the moment to get involved, it's okay, because there are many, 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 many days and needs ahead. It will take all of us to carry this through 
with the dignity and the compassion and the love that is characteristic of our church community. So in general, we're seeing an uptick in church involvement, and we've made it through another holiday season together. Things are not perfect in this world, and still, there is much to feel good about and look forward to. So moving into sources of our faith, the ministry theme for this month is Unitarian Universalism. I'm actually very excited about this month. It's a perfect theme to kick off the new year. There's all sorts of things being offered. I won't run through them all now. You'll read them in the steeple. There's a short video I did coming out about this great array of worship services, topics that include the history, the sources, the principles, um, the anti-racism work, and we even have Eddie Carson returning to talk with us about allyship. We have the course that I'm offering, the films that Julie is offering, David Livingstone, our ministerial intern, is offering a small group um, exercise, or rather group. So there are many ways to get involved. Today, I'm going to start to begin this exploration around the sources of our faith. It is something I invite us to continue, actually, all throughout this year, 2022. I'll return to it at least once more in the calendar year and certainly at the start of 2023. So I invite us to take a year and think about that as I go through this brief reflection. Take a year and focus on one, maybe two, of the sources of our faith, which I'll go into in a moment. One way you can do that is participating in that once a month gathering on Zoom where each time we meet for six months, we'll be discussing a different tradition from which we draw our faith. You may often hear about the principles of Unitarian Universalism, the seven principles that we, the member congregations, covenant to affirm and promote, including the inherent worth and dignity of all people, the democratic process, and the interconnected web of which we are all a part. You are less likely, perhaps, to hear about the sources of our faith. So now I'm speaking more about theology, spirituality, inspiration, wisdom. And yet, these are the tap roots upon which we gain those things. And I think it's unfortunate that we hear less about those sources of faith because I believe that religious pluralism is one of our biggest strengths as a denomination and a congregation. So just a tiny bit of background. While the Unitarians and the Universalists officially merged in 1961, the principles and the sources were first adopted in 1960. It was one of the things done to help make that merger possible. The modern version of the Principles and Sources was adopted in 1984, and the sixth source of our faith was added in 1991. So indeed, we are part of a living faith tradition, which means it grows, it evolves, it changes. It's open to ongoing revelation and evolution. So what are these six sources of our faith? Well, we said them in the responsive reading, but I'll say them again. These are the sources from which we draw inspiration, wisdom, spirituality. These are the sources upon which we build our theology. It's often said, oh, Unitarians, they can believe anything they want. No. So listen to each of these, and as I read them again, I ask you, to, to watch your body, your mind, your response, which is the one or two that is calling to you to focus on this year? Maybe you don't know why it's calling you. Maybe it's something you've always wanted to know more about. Maybe it's something you are not at peace with. All of those are good reasons. So our sources include, number one, direct experience, personal experience. Mysticism is another word for that. Direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder. It's affirmed in all cultures, and it moves us to a renewal of our spirits and an openness to the force that creates and upholds life. 
too. Words and deeds of prophetic people that challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. Three, wisdom from the world's religions, which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. Four, Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Two more. Five, humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and the spirit. And finally, our sixth source, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. It's a beautiful cornucopia of sources, each of them rich in history and possibility. And we are blessed with the freedom to find the path or paths that resonate with us, that challenge us, and that help us grow. And yet, with this blessing comes a responsibility to take that work of spiritual growth seriously. If we apply genuine intention and disciplined effort into learning from these traditions, our spirituality and theology is sure to grow roots and deepen over time and use. If, however, we expect such benefits without commitment and disciplined practice, we will be disappointed. We will be skating on the surface and wondering, where do we go? when we need the deep source of inspiration or wisdom. We don't have to be fanatical, but we need to be consistent. It is, as I said, a great beauty that we have these options, and yet the risk of skimming the surface or not going deep into any one tradition where you find the treasure and the gold. It's good to be familiar with and comfortable around all of the sources of faith, However, it's best when we choose one or two and befriend them and commit to learn what we can from them for a period of time, say a year. So here's the thing about it. I'll concise what I'm going to wrap up with. It isn't about finding the perfect path. It is about trusting that all of them are portals to the same great truths about love, compassion, about bravery, connection, and kinship. But we must follow a source for a period of time to develop a way to receive its deepest gifts and wisdom. There may not be one pathway to truth. However, there does need to be some pathway we follow. So again, I invite you to choose one or two sources you're drawn to this year. This year, I'll be deepening my own journey with our Earth-based sources by following the moon cycle. I'm keeping a moon journal and engaging in spiritual practices and ritual with those who do so. And I'm also learning the harmonium. It's part of my practice and learning about the Sikh tradition, which I've been following for years now. And I know from experience that such deep dives will only deepen my commitment to our Unitarian Universalist faith, and in my case, my Christian roots. Whatever you choose, know that you do so with the love and support of this entire community. For as one of us grows, we all grow. The path to wisdom is rich and deep. May you follow it wherever it shall lead. Amen and blessed be.